Hi everyone, welcome back to the Thinking Crypto channel. I have a very special guest with me, Jeremy Allaire, who's the co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Circle. Jeremy, it's great to be speaking with you today. Thank you so much, it's great to be here. Jeremy, I view you and the folks at Circle as leaders in the crypto industry, and there's so many things I wanna get your perspective on. But before we get to Bitcoin and the market and USDC, let's start with your background. Where are you from, where did you grow up? Yeah, so uh, I, I was born in Philadelphia and then eventually grew up in Minnesota. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I uh, you know, got, got started as an entrepreneur in the internet industry, you know, really back in the early 90s um, before the web um, and um, you know, worked on a number of companies. But back in 1994, 1995, uh, helped create a company uh, with my brother called Alaire Corporation, which actually ended up growing to be a significant sized global public company. Uh, and we created uh, one of the very first um, web programming languages called Cold Fusion. Wow. And um, we built some of the infrastructure that people use still really broadly on the internet today to run interactive applications on the web. We built the most popular HTML design tool with millions of users at the time. It was a significant business. Uh, that we then eventually merged into a larger internet software company called Macromedia, where I was then a chief technology officer and really looked uh, worked on essentially upgrading the internet to be kind of uh, user experience ready for broadband and um, worked on Flash and the Flash platform, which uh, you know had a, a huge growth period. Yep. Um, and then and then eventually um, uh, a after a number of years there uh, became in, in around 2002, 2003 became kind of obsessed with how could we bring television to the internet? How could we actually use the internet as a, as an open platform, as an open network to uh, disintermediate the traditional um, centralized platforms for how media distribution happens. And, and I founded a new company uh, called Brightcode, mm -hmm. uh, which is now a, a significant scale global publicly traded company and, and really built that out um, over a number of years. And then in 2012, I, I fell down uh, or went down the crypto rabbit hole, um, and I'm still very far down in there and uh, have been working on Circle basically since 2013. That's amazing. And you are certainly one of the internet OGs, if, if so to speak. And I've, I, I have to ask, because I've interviewed Brendan Ike who created JavaScript. Yeah, I know Brendan. Do you Absolutely. know Brendan? Have you moved, you know, in the 90s, were you guys maybe in contact at all? At all? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, like, we, we worked a lot on, um, on, on you know, programming language, virtual machines. Um, we actually, uh, we collaborated around the ECMAScript standard, which is sort of the, the industry. That was like the, the open standard version of JavaScript. Um, and, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so very was very close to all of that work. So what was your first encounter with, let's say, Bitcoin? Did someone tell you about it? Did you find it on your own? Yeah, I mean, so I, I found it on my own, um, just, you know, just read, like sort of tech blog reading. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't actually remember the specific blog piece, but then I started kind of, you know, continuing to kind of read more. Um, and it was just one of those things where as a technologist, I was like, how is this possible? Like, wait, I need to better understand this. And so then I like dove in. And, you know, got my, you know, you know, had my first blockchain, uh, you know, wallet, Bitcoin wallet, you know, started testing actual Bitcoin transactions. And and I think it was, you know, I, I have a few different light bulb moments in, in my career um, and, uh, and sort of synchronizing the blockchain uh, and, and being able to conduct a transaction directly on, on my computer back then. It was mm -hmm. just very clearly a revolutionary thing. And, and um and, you know, my, my, my other background that I didn't really talk about is that, you know, I studied kind of um, what I call global political economy mm. um, in, in college and remained very, very interested in global economic um, affairs in international comparative economics uh, in, a, in how the international monetary system functions. And actually that, that interest accelerated for me after the financial crisis. I spent a lot of time uh, in that area. And so um, the sort of, the open internet and it, and what it can do with open standards and technology, kind of converging with um, my interest in in sort of future, you know, significant if not ultimately revolutionary changes to the way the financial system works that I believe are necessary for for sure. humanity. 
um, really made this something quite powerful in terms of an interest for me very quickly. Sure. And I'm assuming some of this, of these ideas or the genesis of these ideas led to you co-founding Circle? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So just once I was immersed in it, thinking about the implications of it, uh, thinking about what, what that might, how that might evolve, the way that we think about what banks are, the way that we think about what, um, even how money moves. Um, and, and I think early ideas that we had that really inspired Founding Circle were, you know, and, and if you go back to early 2013, as an example, um, there were quite vibrant technical communities already around Bitcoin. Um, and there were a lot of different points of view on how to evolve things. But the things that got me really excited were that, you know, this could be like a new infrastructure layer. We could build a lot of other things on top of. And, um, you know, I saw Bitcoin as a sort of commodity money as, as super interesting, mm -hmm. but also saw the, the, the concept of this public infrastructure that, that was secured by something like that digital commodity as really exciting. And the idea of issuing assets on top of this network infrastructure and the ability to create, you know, smart contracts, which back then were, you know, there were, you know, Nick Zabo, like white papers and sure. you know, people in, 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 in various news groups uh, or whatever you want, you know, online forums sort of talking about ideas, but that idea of taking the programmability of these, of these, um, you know, you know, what we now call digital assets, taking that forward, you know, as a, again, as a technologist that had worked on, you know, fundamental things like programming languages and virtual machines and app infrastructure, I could see this would be a profound new way for software to interact with uh, financial uh, assets. And that, you know, basically convinced me that you could ultimately kind of reconstruct what we think of as financial services uh, and, and products that you might get from a bank, but you in the future might get from machines. And that all, you know, was stuff that we saw when we were founding Circle as inevitable um, mm. and that we wanted to kind of work towards um, seeing those things uh, come about. Sure. And what are the services that Circles currently provides? And, and of course, I know USDC is a big part of that, but if you can give us the holistic vision of the company. Yeah, sure. I mean, at, at a high level, just just to uh, you know, share one thing, which is, um, you know, a number of years ago, um, having kind of iterated on the different kinds of technologies that would make, um, you know, moving what we think of as traditional money, like the liabilities of a central bank, making that really easy to move on the Internet, mm -hmm. um, sort of the technology made more of that possible. But it was also, you know, coming up with the governance frameworks, mm -hmm. uh, the, the regulatory frameworks, the assurances that that ultimately market participants would need for something like a dollar digital currency to function sure. uh, on the Internet. Um, so we, you know, several years ago, um, you know, basically put a lot of our effort into how do we how do we construct that and, and cr construct a standard um, for how that can work. And that can, that standard can be an open standard that multiple industry participants can can contribute to. It's open source itself, and then the governance around how that system operates would be a kind of multi-stakeholder governance model. And so we created Center and Center Consortium. Uh, and when we were when Circle was launching the the initial platform for USDC in 2018, we ended up um, you know finding a great partnership with Coinbase. Uh, who shares our vision for an open financial system and, and a lot of, of shared ideas. And uh, they, they got involved in Center and, and became a really critical distribution platform for USDC, uh, you know, in those early days and obviously still now. Um, sure. But, um, uh, you know, we, we basically, you know, first sort of said, OK, how do we create a market infrastructure for these like dollar digital currency or, or what we intend over time to be really any major fiat digital currency um, should be able to use these kind of protocols. But we started obviously with with the, the most important international settlement currency uh, and, and obviously the, the currency that was most relevant to kind of pricing and liquidity in the crypto markets. So um, we built up USDC and launched that. And, you know, I, I think very quickly uh, became the largest um, kind of regulated dollar digital currency. Um, and um, lots of companies in the ecosystem building around it. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, you know, kind of fast forward, I mean, essentially that, that's grown tremendously. And, and so Circle basically has built out a whole suite of services around that sure. as well. So they're sort of operating the USDC market infrastructure, which is really, really critical. And a ton of people, um, you know, use services from us to kind of automate liquidity and interact with that. And then the second was this whole suite of 
um, the Circle account and Circle API services that we've built out very significantly over the last year, which basically allows a, a business or a, a fintech or a commerce firm or even a bank, uh, any type of firm to have um, a, a seamless way to automate moving from the legacy financial system uh, into the digital currency native system to manage account infrastructure that custodies and stores that and then to manage and abstract away all of the kind of transaction management that for, for dealing with stable coins on these public networks and that whole suite of services um, has has the, the 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 kind of capabilities are quite broad and now we have a very fast ramping uh, business there with with a lot of companies that need that connectivity between credit card networks, bank networks, uh, other other currencies in the world, uh, and, and that also more and more companies that are, are new to this, they need the core infrastructure to, you know, they're not going to build out their own custody infrastructure. They're not going to build out their own and run their own nodes. They don't know how to kind of manage scalability. And so just having a kind of underlying um, account uh, custody, security, and blockchain management infrastructure is is really valuable too. So that's a, another piece of what we do. And then the third piece, which um, we've talked about a little bit publicly, and there's info on our website, but we'll launch soon, is uh, uh, Circle's new yield services hmm. that are really aimed at businesses, not at retail individuals. Everything we're doing is aimed at businesses, um, and um, and and th- that product will allow a business to. Uh, you know, convert into USDC and then um, put it through a lending platform that you know generates um, you know four to eight um, uh, percent APY yield uh, wow. as well. That's awesome, and and I've seen the success and the growth for you guys with USDC. And um, I did have a question, and it was actually one from the community. Currently, USDC, if I'm saying this correctly, is positioned on four different blockchains: Ethereum, uh, Algorand, Solano, and then just recently like Stellar. Can you explain um, the dynamic of that? And is your plan to be on one single blockchain or more blockchains? And, and what's your thought process there? Yeah. So, I mean, at, at a high level, um, we think of USDC as as like a money format and a protocol. So if you think about, you know, HTML and HTTP as sort of a content format and a protocol, um, it's, it's ridiculous to imagine that you could only use the web on one operating system. Sure. The whole idea of having a standard that's interoperable is that it can operate on multiple platforms. And, you know, these public chains are like operating systems, essentially. They're compute sure. engines. They're, they're their own kind of proprietary kind of data and transaction management. Um, and it's, there's an enormous amount of innovation happening in that space. Um, we are not maximalists on any given chain. Um, we're, what we are is we, we want to make sure that these standards and protocols that are needed for how uh, money moves on the internet should work um, on on major platforms that can support that capability. Just mm-hmm. like you know the web protocols work on a Samsung refrigerator, they work on an embedded mobile device, they work in you know on on Windows, on Mac, on Linux, on all these things. We want we want USDC. Um, and, and this is really a center consortium thing, which is to who defined a framework for multi-chain USDC, defined a framework for working with blockchain projects that wanted to bring USDC to those chains, mm-hmm. uh, established a whole set of criteria on how to do that. There's a lot of like technical security, audit, reliability. There's a whole bunch of things that have that go into that, which I won't get into the detail on, but that's a framework. And mm-hmm. so Right now, you know, as you as you can see from you know what's going on with layer ones, there's a huge amount of competition there, yeah. and there's a lot of innovation. You know, right now, um, you know, everyone is aware of gas fees and the limitations of the scalability of Ethereum. Right. That's really plagued it for years, um, but the industry is ready for you know global scale retail payments to run on this infrastructure, capital markets to run on this infrastructure. And we need to be able to do that today. And so we we really focused on a number of of chains that um, we think are are quite quite novel and support uh, a number of use cases. And and there'll be more. Um, absolutely. Awesome. And I love your vision for that and and the non maximalism. <laughs> I think to your point, you, you did the analogy right with how the internet um, is, is interoperable with different devices, operating systems, and so forth. So that that's okay. awesome. Now you you did tweet out something that if USDC hits 20 billion in volume, you would do a rap video. <laughs> Can you tell us about yeah. that? Yeah, I did. I did. So that, that actually, that actually is, 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 is um, my, my, my head of sales and <laughs> revenue. Uh, uh, he, he had lost a challenge um, where he ended up having to do, I think it was 75 pushups uh, <laughs> publicly. Uh, but, but um, uh, he, he issued a challenge 
uh, you know, and he had given out a number. I said, it's got to be higher. It was like too low. <laughs> but unfortunately, I, th I think it's almost certain uh, at this point that I'm going to be producing a, a rap video uh, about USDC later this year. Well, that's a good problem to have, right? It's a success that comes with it. Um, so there was some news of a visa integration of using USDC. Can you tell us about that relationship? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in December, we announced a, a broad partnership with Visa. It spans a number of different areas. Uh, it, it includes, um, you, you know, um, I think most notably work that we're doing with Visa to enable um, essentially, you know, digital wallets that they work with all around the world um, who are digital wallets that issue Visa cards or virtual cards or credentials uh, to be able to support a seamless way to receive payments in USDC. And then, and then to use USDC as this as essentially the electronic stored value uh, behind a card transaction, and so I, I think they're they're very very uh, interested as are we in you know internet commerce and and marketplace businesses and others that that really need to pay people all around the world, and basically you know using USDC as the settlement infrastructure to do that and enable the, that payment activity to happen globally. So if you're, you know, uh, someone who's in, involved in, a, in an internet platform and you need to receive a payment, you can do that into a digital wallet, all done through crypto, and then just spend that um, right away uh, at, at a terminal. There's more that we're doing there. We're, um, we have a, a number of things that we're doing together with Visa to introduce uh, Circle's infrastructure and USDC to uh, their, their broad network of, of uh, fintech firms and financial institutions and others that they work with. And so... That's a, a key part of the partnership as well, which is which is uh, ramping up quite a bit. That's awesome, and I'm certainly a big partner for you guys. And I know it looks like all these credit card companies we just heard from Mastercard are looking to expand their horizons in the crypto market. Um, I did want to ask because I saw on your website, and it relates to something you tweeted about recently with companies putting Bitcoin in their balance sheet. You alluded to. Uh, another avenue or way to do this is through USDC. And there is a initiative, Dollar Stable Coins and Corporate Treasury Management Initiative. Are those two things uh, related? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so when, when we think about what Circle operates, you know, with a Circle account um, and, the, and, and the infrastructure that we provide, you know, we describe it as sort of payments and treasury infrastructure for the internet. Hmm. And when you think about what a business is, you know, at the core is their treasury and that treasury is sort of where they hold their value and uh, and they and their treasury is they attach it to various different ways to move value and, and support, um, you know, payments in and out. Um, we think more and more of that activity will be digital currency native. Sure. Uh, but we also think the storage of money um, and 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 actually how people. Um, you know, take their working capital that they might have and find ways if they're not using that working capital to generate a return from it. Yep. And that's sort of the cash management side of what you think of in, in traditional kind of corporate treasury, commercial banking, uh, et cetera. We see a huge opportunity for that that is crypto native. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, yeah, the first thing that we're doing is what I talked about earlier, which is uh, if, if you essentially, if you don't necessarily want to buy Bitcoin and put it on your on your on your corporate balance sheet or on your in your treasury, uh, you can get exposure to what's happening in that market by essentially converting into USDC. The USDC then gets lent out into the crypto markets and you're effectively getting a, a, a passive yield from sure. uh, the, the market activity that's going on in crypto. Uh, that's OK. So that totally makes sense. It's another option for uh, corporations. If you don't yeah, want to put absolutely. Bitcoin, so it. some corporations yeah. will, will want to have assets denominated in BTC sure. or ETH or what have you. And some corporations are happy to say, I, I'm interested in what is going on over there, but I, I'd like a dollar asset, basically sure. a dollar denominated asset. Um, and, and that that sometimes is, is uh, you know, that's quite a large market, actually, that, that, you know, when you look at the trillions of dollars that sits on corporate balance sheets around the world, you know, a, a lot of that is is in these sort of dollar based kind of uh, products, money markets, things like that. Sure. So I'm assuming you may be knocking on Elon Musk's uh, door, maybe micro strategies. Well, I tweeted. Uh, <laughs> I tweeted to him. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully we'll hear back from his CFO or treasurer. For sure. Um, so I do want to ask you about central bank digital currencies. Obviously, central banks around the globe are looking to build their own digital version of their fiats. Do you see that as a competition, something that might take market share from you, or it complements what you're doing because USDC is more for retail, but also for corporates. 
uh, but the central banks can use their own CBDCs among themselves. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I've talked extensively about this, and 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 um, and and there are you know episodes on my podcast, lots of stuff that talk about this. But just just very quickly in summary, you know, we really believe that um, in in most parts of the world, uh, including most certainly in the United States and Europe and and many other you know markets, that um, the the history of electronic money is is a history of private sector uh, actors um, coming together in consortiums to define standards and technologies and interoperability, mm -hmm. and then enabling those networks to achieve scale. Uh, and that is basically how, how uh, nearly all kind of electronic money works for businesses and, and, and individuals in the world. We don't think it's gonna be any different going forward. We think it's very much the same thing. And one of the things that in, in, in the United States certainly, uh, which is true is that uh, there's an enormous amount of private sector innovation. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the federal government isn't, you know, you know, building uh, uh, things uh, really. They're, they're helping ensure that there's rules of the road. Sure. They're making sure things are safe and sound and that risks are managed appropriately. And I think that's really what the role is of financial regulators and central banks. Uh, it's, it, they, they obviously want to maintain uh, their ability to issue debt, uh, their ability to collect taxes. Uh, those are really critical functions, but you know, fundamental innovation in in infrastructure for how money uh, operates that's going to come from the private sector. And most notably, we're entering the the age the 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 sort of age of internet money and of of a financial system built entirely on the internet, and, right. and that's much more different as well because it's going to be built on open source software. It's gonna be built on open protocols. It's gonna be built on decentralized infrastructure that works all around the world. That's how the internet's built, inversely everything else. And that's how it's gonna be built in this new financial system. And I think that that, that the, the kind of, again, the innovation and, and, and the advancements and, and frankly, ultimately the resiliency mm -hmm. that comes from that is gonna be far, far greater than any government agency would ever be able to, to do. So I, I think what's more likely is, um, you know, central banks will sort of look at arrangements like center consortium uh, and they'll say, hey, this is really critically important. We wanna make sure it's safe and sound and the risks are managed well, the reserves uh, can, can be, you know, uh, could potentially be reserves held in a central bank, those kinds of things. So that that may be really how it evolves, and and that's what um, what uh, you know the IMF uh, uh, and 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 I also call a hybrid CBDC, uh, which sure. is to say uh, the the kind of um, reserves and and relationship to to the central bank is a kind of supervised activity, but the actual um, execution on this is is private sector based. Sure. So Jeremy, I, if you don't mind me asking, would would an ideal scenario for you be? The Federal Reserve says, Jeremy, we want to adopt the USDC. That's going to be our CBDC. Well, I doubt that that'll happen okay. anytime soon. But I, <laughs> I think um, we, we certainly, you know, as a member of Center Consortium, uh, you know, we, we would like to see more really high quality, um, you know, payment networks, um, you know, large consumer fintech firms and, and even banks be involved. Uh, in setting those standards and, and implementing that that sort of interoperability, uh, but it's not just about the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a global phenomenon, uh, and countries around the world want to also access in this innovation. As you know, you know, crypto finance firms are are innovating in every country in the world yeah. right now, um, and so there's an opportunity to uh, tap all that innovation and connect local currencies to the same set of standards. Uh, so you effectively have the ability to move value across, uh, you know, digital fiat, if you will, uh, at the speed of the Internet, the cost efficiency of the Internet. And I think you're going to see a lot more of that uh, over the next couple of years. For sure. Um, so I do want to ask, and I know many things are sometimes under NDAs and in the process and you have your PR releases. But any hints you can give to us as to maybe what may be coming uh, for Circle or USDC in the, in the upcoming months? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, you know, we're, we're always working on stuff. Uh, I think um, we, um, I, I could talk about a couple of things. I think one I've, I've alluded to, which is, you know, how to make it easy for businesses to, uh, to you know, basically take advantage of, of um, what's happening with, with, with yield uh, around, around things like USDC. So, so that's really important. And I think when people think about what's going to bring more businesses into using digital currency, 
I think that's going to be one of the things, one of the first things that really does. Sure. Uh, and then as businesses do that, they'll say, wow, these stable coins are really powerful. Uh, this is this is an incredible way to, to settle a transaction. How else can I use this across my business? Uh, and then they'll see this ecosystem of, of smart contracts and, and innovations that they can connect to and, and, and take advantage of. And so I, I think those flywheels get going. And, and so we're very focused on that. And related to that, I think one thing is um, we really see an opportunity to create the best on-ramp possible for businesses sure. uh, that want to take advantage of what's happening with with, with this kind of infrastructure and, and digital currency. And so that's really a big focus for us and just continuing to improve that that user experience for businesses that want to get involved, not just retail investors or traders or things like that, but really businesses who want to actually start to take advantage of this infrastructure um, in, in powerful ways uh, for, for both their bottom line and their and their operating efficiency. That's awesome. And I, I think certainly it's very the, the ability to earn um, yield and, and, and you know, on, on the USDC is certainly appealing. Um, that has me thinking about a few things. And I don't know that's available to retailers just for, uh, you know, corporates. Um, but any plans for a retail to be involved in that? And we're, we're a pure, um, yeah, we're, we're purely focused on being a platform for businesses. Sure. But there are tons of companies that are retail facing that build on top of what we're doing. And so we want to just enable that whole ecosystem to thrive. We work with, you know, many, many fantastic retail facing, uh, you know, products and services and want to keep supporting those. Awesome. So I want to switch gears a bit and talk about Bitcoin, um, which yeah. has been uh, on a serious rally and we hit 48,000. I think it was yesterday, some new all time highs. You know, g give me your perspective. Someone who's been here since 2012 and uh, I'm sure you're holding some Bitcoin. Um, what's your thoughts on, on the whole bull market that's happening? Well, you know, I, uh, I, I'm not surprised at all. So, I mean, my, my view um, kind of coming into the year was that um, just given various, you know, dynamics or, you know, even not not just coming into the year, but but really last year uh, that, you know, sort of felt like the, the sort of next logical place would be in the 40,000s. Um, and uh, that happened pretty quickly. I think, you know, very clearly the next logical place from here is in the 60,000s. Uh, that's, I think, likely to happen in the coming months. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I, I, th I think what we're seeing is a, a huge, a huge build out of this. Uh, and, you know, there's an enormous amount of activity where, you know, this is becoming a, a significant asset for a, a much broader base of, of holders. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, my, my view is, is, is that, um, you know, seeing Bitcoin in the 150 to 200,000 range is, is very much in sight right now. Um, just just high level how I think about um, the, sure. the, the pricing dynamics. Now, will there be sharp pullbacks? Uh, will there be yeah. sustained pullbacks? Sure. I mean, it would make sense uh, for, for something as volatile as this. Um, but the fundamentals are so strong. Um, and I think the demand side of this is very, very strong and will continue to be given what's happening in a global macro context. Um, it, 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 it has that. And, and I think, you know, the more this becomes a, a, a balance sheet asset for financial institutions, for corporations, uh, I think, you know, very likely this will be a balance sheet asset for some number of central banks in the world. As that happens, I think this, you know, this uh, Bitcoin certainly grows towards reserve currency status, uh, certainly in the next decade. Yeah, and it's amazing to see what's taking place the, from adoption from corporates, obviously Elon Musk and Tesla. But I recently interviewed the mayor of Miami, and I know he had a press conference last night. They're looking to put or allocate some of the city's treasuries to Bitcoin. When, when, when do you see a pushback from like the likes of the IMF and and just some government officials? Because it's like, wait a minute. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I I think there is still um, a massive disconnect. Um, I think that there's. In, in, in what I would describe as there's a, still a massive amount of cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. that occurs. Uh, I think that the concept uh, of uh, non-state, uh, you know, commodity money uh, is something that, you know, most people in power, uh, most people who run uh, governments mm -hmm. uh, are, are very uncomfortable with, even though that is largely the history of, of money. Sure. Uh, people uh, for, you know, the last 50, 60 years, um, have really been accustomed to uh, uh, fiat, as we understand it, and the notion that the world may be making a major change back to non-sovereign commodity money is 
is very um, it's it's very disorienting for people, and especially I think a lot of the people who are in positions of power mm-hmm. uh, in 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 government or or supranational monetary authorities or other things. I think while they will profess an openness to uh, technical innovation, uh, it tends to be you know how can we improve the payment system? Uh, how can we make things more efficient? Uh, it's never in the the actually un- underlying uh, basis of money in, in the monetary system. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, you know, something that is, you know, tr- truly built as a decentralized, you know, in- internet-based uh, form of commodity money, I just think it's very hard for people to understand. And I think that cognitive dissonance leads people to be extremely dismissive. Um, and I think, um, you know, th- there is a very real and what will be a growing uh, you know, set of sharp divisions uh, that will be expressed, I think, in increasingly in a political context in countries all around the world between those that believe in hard money and those that believe in, uh, you know, debt-based money in, in the traditional fiat sense. And um, there's going to be some battles fought. Um, and I think, you know, that's going to be the case uh, in many places. You see the rhetoric is really picking up in some in some quarters. Uh, and I think in particular in countries with very weak currencies, uh, you're going to see large sectors of society opting into a non-sovereign uh, you know, form of digital money, but also things like stable coins as well. Sure. And, and so there are real sovereignty issues. And I do believe that that's going to cause crises in more places in the world. Um, and so that's something that we're going to have to confront. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the trend that started, do you, do you see Google, Apple, Amazons of the world? starting to put Bitcoin in a balance sheet sometime this year? Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that I would say that that's, that's a foregone conclusion uh, at all. Got it. It's just to be seen, I guess. But um, I, I'm, I personally, because I hold Bitcoin, I'm hoping under the green flag from Elon uh, th- that this trend continues. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see, I, I guess. Um, and as far as Bitcoin mining, I, I, there seems to be a boom happening here in the United States. And do you see kind of a global macroeconomic battle for the control of hash rate of Bitcoin, given we just heard about Russia in Siberia, 20,000 yep. mining uh, machines there. And the U.S., some of the biggest mining farms being built in the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've talked about about this um, and, and, you know, uh, and, and I've said publicly as well that I think um, there are there is an increase in concern with senior national security officials in the United States that the concentration of hash power in certain geographies poses a, a, a poses a risk um, economically. Uh, that's significant. I, I think um, I, I think you're going to see more state backed efforts hmm. to support regional, um, uh, you know, you know, kind of mining and 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 data center infrastructure uh, that is oriented towards securing crypto networks um, at the end of the day if you look at blockchains as uh, effectively as these crypto networks that have many many applications many many uses and having crypto networks that are censorship resistant that also can can uh, withstand nation state attack vectors is is really really critical uh, and so i do believe that um Increasingly, countries will treat the, uh, the their involvement in these global public crypto networks as as a strategic priority. Um, I, I I've said as well that I think um, you know ultimately um, uh, that you know even proof of work um, mining is going to lead to continue to lead to some of the most significant breakthroughs in renewable energy as well. Mm. Uh, and we're already seeing that um, an enormous amount of, of what's taking place is. You know, focused on optimizing for the cost of electricity. And if you want to optimize for the cost of electricity, you want to get it as close to free as possible. And the only way to get it to, as close to free as possible is by harvesting renewable energy. And so um, I don't think people quite realize that when people talk about a Green New Deal in the United States, I think that needs to include uh, investments to support North American mining, uh, very specifically green energy uh, mining infrastructure mm. that'll create jobs. It'll create renewable yes. energy jobs. It'll create economic opportunity in communities around the country. Uh, and so I, 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 I hope to see Joe Biden talking about how the United States is going to be a world leader in Bitcoin mining, and it's going to be part of our effort to meet the obligations of the Paris Accords. 
Sure. And and do you see the Biden administration, not to get political and, and right and left, but it, 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 more crypto friendly? I know on towards the end of uh, Trump's administration, Mnuchin tried to throw in some wallet regulations and Jay Clayton did some stuff with Ripple. Do you see, you know, maybe a, a greater path forward for, for crypto under this administration? You know, I think it's, it's, it's really easy to sort of try and think that, you know, there's a person or a group of people that, you know, are going to sway this way or that way. I think the important thing about the federal government is that these agencies, um, these, these agencies that are, are really, you know, kind of stewards of, of oversight, um, you know, these are staffed by, um, I think, you know, career civil servants. Hmm. Uh, there's an enormous amount of, uh, and, and in Congress too, I mean, the policy staffers that work the Hill, um, all these people. And, and what I would say is it's remarkable how much more educated and engaged policymakers are in every tier of government uh, from, you know, small offices of, of, of relatively small congressional districts up to, you know, leadership of the SEC, uh, like Gary Gensler. Yeah. So there's a lot of education. There's a lot more awareness. This has obviously become a critical set of emerging market infrastructure. I think that you're going to see engagement. It's going to be constructive. People are going to want to figure it out. Uh, this is not going to be knee-jerk reactions and, and things like that. I think people want to get it right. They understand this is a significant infrastructure. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite optimistic. And and um, and I think we, we are certainly on a positive side. We're now in a political environment. And and in, in the federal government as well, where I think there's more of a sense that things can get done. Uh, I think um, there was, uh, I think, less of a sense that things can get done um, over the past four years. Uh, and so I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. And I know um, I've seen you and, and just even Circle mention in the efforts to lobby and to bring this dialogue and discourse with the folks in, in D.C., um, can you tell us a bit about what you guys are doing as far as initiatives? Is it lobbying? Is it just setting up um, uh, groups, alliances, and so forth? I mean, we're just very supportive of of, uh, of the groups that that have spent incredible amounts of time and energy in DC over the years. You know, we're we're uh, we're contributors to Coin Center. We're members of the mm -hmm. Blockchain Association. We're members of the Digital Chamber of Commerce. So we're and we're very active in all of those. And and those are really the the groups that are doing uh, doing the work. Uh, and so certainly I, I, I spend some time myself um, involved with and engaged with, um, you know, policymakers, uh, you know, from time to time. Um, but really, it's about just building up, you know, industry's uh, presence overall. Sure. And, and I appreciate you doing that. I think a lot of folks look to you and, and circle of, you know, the actions and the steps you guys have taken. So definitely appreciate that. I do want to get your thoughts. I know we're wrapping up on time here on the Ripple uh, SEC lawsuit situation. What, what what are your thoughts on that whole thing? Yeah, you know, I haven't I haven't read the the case or the responses, and so I, I would say I have a pretty uninformed uh, opinion about it. Um, so I'm not probably the best person to comment on the details or the merits of of uh, of that. I mean, I think um, you know there there are a lot of a lot of companies in the industry that have uh, you know supported. Uh, you know, Ripple as a virtual currency um, for for a very long time, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, again, you know, I, I don't I don't really have a view into the facts and circumstances or merits there. I expect that this will be a you know a pretty involved uh, back and forth over the coming years. Sure. So I do want to talk about DeFi. Uh, get your thoughts on that, and I, I I see exponential opportunities with DeFi. What, what are your thoughts on it? Absolutely. I mean, you know, when we founded Circle, the thing that got us most excited was, you know, once once we got to a phase where you had fiat digital currencies like USDC, that uh, the programmability of of that money um, and and of of you know digital assets more broadly was going to really foster huge amounts of innovation in in how financial services and, and financial market infrastructure could function. Uh, and so it's just incredibly exciting to see that happen. I think we're, you know, we're in the, you know, what do you, whatever you want to call it, the first thing, first inning, the second inning, sure. <laughs> we're, we're still very early in that. Um, and I think um, we're very big believers that uh, decentralized finance uh, and that kind of model for, uh, for market, for markets and for market infrastructure 
um, is going to become a, a backbone of, uh, of the global um, economic system over time. Awesome. So final question here as we wrap it up, some rapid fire questions. Uh, what's your favorite food? Uh, Indian food. Awesome. Uh, what's your favorite musician or band? Or who I should say? Uh, I would just say category uh, EDM. It, really? I would not uh, have guessed that, Jeremy. <laughs> but that's mm -hmm. awesome. Fa uh, favorite movie? Shawshank Redemption. Ah, good one. Uh, favorite book? Oh, um, The Soccer Wars. Hmm. Haven't heard of that. I'll have to check that one out. And when you're not at Circle or you know looking at the crypto market, what are you doing for fun? Just hanging out with my kids and my family. Awesome. Jeremy, uh, thank you so much. I've learned so much from you today and wish you best of luck with Circle and USDC. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tony.